morning, everybody. Good morning. So excited to be here for the Mayor's Walk Against Domestic Violence. I am Andrea Mock from WLTX, and I am so honored to be here and be a part of today. And um, I, I have to tell you guys something that I have never actually said out loud before. Um, about why I wanted to come today, but I am also a survivor of domestic violence. Thank you. Well, that feels better than it thought to say that out loud. Um, but like so many women, you know, this is our blessing and our curse, y'all. We love and we love hard. And we put everybody in our lives first. And we also feel an innate need to fix it. I'm gonna fix it. If I love a little harder, if I don't do this, if I don't do this, if I don't make him angry, if I do all the things he asks me to, if I keep the kitchen clean, if I, you know, I can fix it. And it gets to the point in your life where you're in that cycle, right? How many of us know the cycle? Raise your hand if you've been in the cycle. And the cycle is, you believe it's gonna change, you have a good period, and you think, this is it. It's changing this time. He's not going to do it again. He understands what he did was wrong. I believe him when he says he wants to be a better man. And then something sets it off. It happens again. There's an explosion. And then after the explosion, there's a lot of apologies, a lot of making up, a lot of saying it'll never happen again. And then what happens? We fall right back into the cycle. And um, it's one of the hardest cycles to get out of in the entire world because as women, we are such lovers. God has blessed us with so much love in our hearts and the ability to love and capacities that I can't even understand or put into words. So you just think, I can love this person out of it. And then you realize, and thank God I realized, no, I gotta love myself out of it. And I have to love myself enough to get myself away from this situation. So I want to say God bless every strong woman and man in this audience today. Thank you for loving yourself enough and your friends and your family and your sisters and your moms and your aunties and your girlfriends to help get them out of it. It does take a village and you have support. And here in Columbia, let me say, you have more support than you even know. You have support here in the city. You have support from Richland County Sheriff's deputies. You have support from City of Columbia Police Department. You have support from your coroner. You have support from your Fifth Circuit solicitor. There is a team that will support you and love you from SCAD VASA, from Sister Care. We have an army of people here so you don't have to stay. You can get out. And if you know somebody you love, if you are in that situation yourself, we want to love you out of it here today, and that's why we're here. So thank you so much to the mayor for inviting me to be here today. Thank you to all of our providers. I want to give a big shout out for all of our tables that we had. City of Columbia Office of Violent Crime Prevention, Columbia Police Law Enforcement Victims Advocates, Hush No More, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, Sister Care, SCAD VASA, Serve and Connect, Beat Midlands Be Smart, our Fifth Circuit Solicitor, Fort Jackson Family Advocacy Department, and the Hive Community Circle. Thank you so much to all of you for being here today. And with that, we want to go ahead and welcome to the podium the man behind the hour, our Mayor Daniel Rickman. Well, first of all, I want to welcome everyone, and, but also want to thank you for taking time out of your day to be here this morning. I've had an opportunity to get very wet this morning. <laughs> um, it seems that I've spent a lot of time, it's the third time I've been in the dunking booth uh, for sister care, and uh, I love every minute of it, to be honest with you, because people who are willing to be out and support such a great organization as sister care and all the partners that are here to talk about it. But what's really, for me, being here is actually having an opportunity to talk to people. I've talked to people here today who are 20-year survivors, 12-year survivors, 15-year survivors. I didn't even, whoop, 
Yeah. We just ran out of energy. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking real loud. I don't know if everybody can hear me. You got a voice that carries me. All right, thank you. <laughs> Domestic violence is an issue that we all got to work together on. It's not an issue that we need to talk about once a month when we have when we have this walk or once a day. I mean, we need to talk about it all the time. We need to make sure that people realize their resources here, that you don't need to live this way, that there are opportunities. Y'all, we are in the top 10 in the country for domestic violence in the state of South Carolina. The top 10, actually we're number six. At one point, uh, uh, a survivor told me this morning when she moved to South Carolina, we were one or two. We're making progress, but we are not where we need to be. We need to be at the bottom of that 50 because that's who we are as a city and a state and a county. So I want to thank everybody for being here because, you know, when there's over 18,000 women and men in domestic violence each year in our, our state, 18,000 people that are going through something that they shouldn't have to go through. And we understand that it's, it's, it affects families, it affects children, it affects your work environment, it affects everything about you. But I want you, Andrea did such a great job talking about all the resources and opportunities that are here. Y'all, let's, let's stomp domestic violence out. Let's take it all the way to the bottom of the list. Let's make it something that we don't have to think about, that we are here to take care. But I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to uh, invite our fifth solicitor up to speak next. Um, Byron, please join us up here, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I think we're back in business. For the moment. Tell you what, I'll do that. As we know, uh, this is October, and it is uh, the month that we choose to focus on domestic violence and the effects that it has on our families, on our communities, on our children. But one of the things we have to understand is it can't just be October when we have this focus. It needs to be a focus that we have every day of the year, every month of the year. And it, we need that focus because if children see domestic violence in their homes, they're more than likely going to repeat it as they become teenagers and as they become adults. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the time that we spend with them talking to them about the effects of it and what it means, what it doesn't mean, what it means to be able to de-escalate, what it means to be able to talk through issues, what it means to be able to, uh, to love your partner, to love your mother, your sister, your brother, your, your father without violence, to resolve issues without con in conflicts without violence, when we can teach them that and show them those things, it only betters the city that we have and helps us reach our fullest potential. When I first took this stage back in 2020, the numbers were something like 36 women in South Carolina died as a result of domestic violence, and six men in South Carolina died as a result of domestic violence. So my crude math tells me that's 42 families that were irreparably changed by domestic violence. Today I stand before you in 2024 telling you that the Attorney General's numbers tell us that this year, excuse me, last year, 30 people died of domestic violence related issues. So there were 24 women and six men. So that's a difference of 12 people over four years. So there's progress that's being made but it's not enough because there's still 30 families who are irreparably changed by domestic violence. So what I suggest to you is this, we have to continue to teach and, and, and help people understand that there are resources that are available. If you're in a relationship where there is abuse that's occurring, there are people on the stage who are here who will help you. They will help you, they will reach out to you. They are only a phone call away. So reach out to these resources because they can give us the tools to survive, not just survive, but to thrive through domestic violence. And to my men who are out here, if you're in a relationship and you're having stresses and you're feeling that, that you can't control your anger, there are resources for you as well. Get the help that's needed. 
because our families need all of us and they need all of us to respect all of us and to grow the way that we need to grow in teaching our children so that we don't repeat these behaviors. Again, I stand before you saying that it's time for us to never be quiet about domestic violence. We have to talk about it, we have to learn from it, and we have to power forward. And so in this city, that's what we do. We thrive, we survive, and we, and, and, and we are looking forward to all of the good that each one of you and each one of us can bring to it. But we can only do that if we nurture our families correctly and we stamp out the issue of domestic violence. So as we walk together, let's talk, let's converse, let's, let's understand one another better, and let's find ways to fix our families, to fix ourselves, so that we can stop seeing that number in South Carolina grow, and we can continue watching our number of folks who are dying at the hands of domestic violence, or who are even subjected to it, become lower every day. So thank you for your presence, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Is it working? Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much, Fifth Circuit Solicitor Byron Gibson. And, you know, one of the things we know about domestic violence is so often the woman refuses, or man, refuses to press charges and um, or will call the police but then not want to press charges. So it's so important to have good support not only from the police but also from our solicitors. So thank you so much for being with us. All right, I have to talk one second about um, inspiring women. You know, we all have a voice, right? Each one of us. None of us is, is more powerful than the other. Every woman in this audience, and a lot of you I got to meet today, we have a voice. And I have to say, our coroner, Nader Rutherford, is one of the people that I admire the most because she got her platform and said, I am going to use my voice for good. And if you don't follow her on social media, I am telling you, you need to follow her. Number one, she can cut an apple with a knife in one piece. Who does that? How does she does that? It's amazing. But she will give you life lessons while she does it. She talks to women every day about protecting yourself, protecting your assets, having a will, making sure that if something happens to your husband or your boyfriend or your partner that you're living under his roof, that you have protection. And it's not something we all think about. And to be honest with you, before my friendship with her, it's not even something that I thought about often. So she is such an amazing advocate for women. So I want to invite up our coroner in Richland County, Nada Rutherford. Yeah. <laughs> Put that right there. You want to ask everybody to creep in a little tighter, yeah. Can y'all come closer? <laughs> I want to feel your energy. There you go. <laughs> but I also want you to hear what's being said. Y'all come a little closer. Hey, y'all. Hey. Hey. Now, I wrote something because I wanted to be very clear about my messaging this morning, okay? Every case that crosses my desk tells a story. A story of pain, fear, and sometimes an end that could have been prevented when those cases involve domestic violence. Behind closed doors in homes that should be sanctuaries, a darker reality unfolds. Victims of domestic violence often suffer in silence, trapped in a cycle, like Andrea said, of fear and control, believing that there is no escape from their torment. As the coroner, I'm often called to examine the physical remnants of such tragic lives. Each autopsy reveals the harsh truth, the bruises, the gunshot wounds, the fractures, or the signs of a struggle. But what haunts me the most are the stories that will never be told about these victims, their hopes, and their dreams that are extinguished because of domestic violence. The families that are shattered and their futures that are lost forever. I want you to imagine for a moment that you have no resources, that you have no job, that you have no money that you control, and you have children who depend on you for love and care and support. 
and you are in the home of a person that is supposed to love you, but instead of loving you, they use that financial situation that you're in that they once told you that they would take care of you, and now they use it as a weapon against you. I hear so much, why didn't she leave? Sometimes these women cannot leave. Sometimes they feel like they cannot find a place to go because they've told their story so many times that people don't believe them or they don't offer the support. Believe her every time. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's not just women who are affected by domestic violence. We know that children are affected. We know that men are affected. I'm asking you as a community to come a little closer. I'm asking you as a community to listen a little longer, to stand in the gap when it is needed the most. As the coroner, I don't want cases that are preventable like this. We see enough death and tragedy from unexpected deaths. We shouldn't expect the victims of domestic violence to die. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for standing in support of our awesome mayor and the work that he is doing. Hopefully, our support can help stomp out domestic violence. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And one of the things that she said that stuck out to me so much is believe her every time. And to do that, it is so important to have the support of your law enforcement. And up here, unfortunately, he can't stand up because he just had surgery and came to the walk anyway. And our police chief, Skip heart and I know he is an advocate for women every single day and has worked tirelessly to make our city safer so skip over please chief. All right thank you so much chief and thank you for being here just after your surgery. He was speaking about resources. One of the resources is the Office of Violent Crime Prevention so we want to invite uh, Trayvon Fordham, Mr. Fordham to the stage. All right good morning everybody. Yeah, my name is Trevon Ford. I'm the director for the Office of Violent Crime Prevention. Uh, as we talk about resources and working with community partners, um, as an extension to the law enforcement partners and partners across the state of South Carolina, uh, we are here as an additional resource, particularly when it comes to domestic violence as well. Um, since I don't have the microphone, I'm going to kind of just project out, almost like I'm at a probate, like the <laughs> and I folks say. But uh, I want to start off by thanking each and every one of you for being here this morning. So please, please, please give yourself a round of applause for being here this morning. You being here today shows your commitment to speak out, to stand up, and to be advocates for those who may not be, have a voice or who may be suffering in silence. As we talk about breaking that stigma for those who are suffering in silence, who may not feel like they can speak out on their own, who may not feel like the resources are available, who may not feel like there are places for them to go, we can be the advocates, we can be some of the voices to really guide them and help them and sometimes just being there, just being there for when they are ready to share their story, when they are ready to step out of that silence and step towards the resources. That's what it's gonna take for those who are suffering in silence. Having advocates sometimes can make all of the difference for those who are suffering in silence and who are dealing with pains that we can see that are physical and sometimes the pains and traumas that we can't always see when it comes to the psychological, when it comes to the mental torment and anguish and trauma that comes from domestic violence. So being that advocate, being that voice, being that friend makes a difference. And that's why we're all here today. So you being here is a great sign of things to come as we all cast down the stigma that is domestic violence. While I have a few minutes, I wanna talk about what's normal. We hear it all the time, a lot of times we do things throughout our day because it's normal, it's routine. It's what we do every day, right? But oftentimes I sit back and I think sometimes, that's not normal. I don't know if y'all like me, but I look at things the way it's done, I'm like, yeah, that ain't normal. <laughs> all right? With that being said, us getting together as a community, would everybody agree that's pretty normal? 
Yes. I, it's normal. I love it when we get together as a community. Us getting together to mourn someone that was murdered from domestic violence. That's not normal. Our children being raised in loving homes when they see examples of kindness, cooperation, togetherness. That's normal. Our kids being raised in homes where they see nothing but violence and rage. Firsthand, that's not normal. Our teenagers experiencing healthy relationships. That, my friends, is normal. Them seeing toxic relationships, it's not normal. Television, movies, music, social media, all sharing positive message of hope and success. That's normal. Our folks, our community seeing nothing but violence in their movies, their videos, hearing it in the music, that should not be normal. Adults who understand that love is patient, it's kind, it's understanding, it's unconditional, all the things that we heard about in Bible study, right? That's normal. Adults who use the word love as they really want to hide control, physical abuse, mental anguish, and torment, that is not normal. So as I'm looking out, I'm seeing some of your facial expressions, right? And I can kind of tell. We talk about what's normal. We all know that a lot of things that I said that are normal are really not normal. They should be normal, but they're not. I won't rattle off statistics, but I will say we have far too many women that die at the hands of their partners. We have men who are in a relationships that are abusive. We have children that are in homes where they see domestic violence, they see unhealthy relationships every single day. I'm here today to say that's not normal. And as we move forward, we have to change that. We have to change the narrative of what's normal. As we're all here and we're working together as a community, advocates, we have to continue to be advocates for what the new normal is. And for some, it's getting back to what we knew as being normal. So I will challenge everybody today that's here, as we continue to, to fellowship amongst one another, as we go and do our walk, and then guess what? We leave from here. For the rest of this year and each day moving forward, let's all think about what's normal as we model, as adults, what normal should be in our relationships, in our homes, and as we are out for not only our young people, but for others who are out. Again, our office is always here. You can get our contact information, go to the City of Columbia's website. We have an office website for resources and support. We are here because we want to put out, we want to maintain and sustain what is the new normal. God bless every one of y'all. Thank y'all. message. Thank you so much. And next up, we have Shannon Nix from SCAD Bassett to talk about their resources and how they can support anybody in need. All right. Good morning. I hope y'all can hear me. Um, I worked with college students for like 20 years, so I hope that helps me in my voice and my projection. Um, I'm so honored to be here with all of you today. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge um, what we've all been through this past week due to Hurricane Helene. Some of you may have families. I have family that's still without power in another part of the state. So I just want to be, I'm so grateful you're here after what I'm sure has been a very difficult week and will continue to be a difficult time. Um, this year, so every year Skibasa has a theme for our Domestic Violence Awareness Month campaign. And this year, our theme is know what to say, know what to do. We have little fold-out cards on our table with this. Um, and this complements the National Network to End Domestic Violence, their national messaging campaign, which is everyone knows someone. We chose this as our theme because we know that most victims of domestic violence tell a friend or family member about the abuse before reporting it, whether it's to law enforcement or to sister care or a confidential resource. <laughs> um, let me lose my place, y'all. If those friends and family members know what to say, 
and know what to do when their loved ones share about experiencing domestic violence, then they are helping that survivor take a step towards safety and healing. Knowing what to say includes responding in a non-judgmental and empathic way. And knowing what to do includes providing resources for when survivors are ready to reach out for help. In doing these things, we lessen feelings of shame and we contribute to a society in which survivors feel safe and heard when reporting their domestic violence experiences. One of the messages from the campaign that really resonates with me is this one. Domestic violence is often hidden from friends, family, and neighbors. It can feel sad and shocking to learn that someone you know is abusive, but survivors know their story better than anyone. Believe them the first time. We often don't want to believe that someone we know and love or someone we look up to is capable of such harm. Therefore, instead of believing survivors, people may respond to them with doubt and disbelief, which often silences survivors and can lead to feelings of shame and isolation. This contributes to a culture of silence around domestic violence in which survivors are not believed when they share what is happening in their relationships and in their homes. But when we know what to say and do, including listening without judgment and providing support and resources, we can foster a culture of support that does not tolerate harm or silence. For this to happen, just like a lot of people behind me have said already, it takes every single one of us. I challenge all of you to listen without judgment, to respond with empathy and compassion, and to learn the resources for domestic violence survivors in your area. Thank you so much. Just want to read a quick statistic, and for those of you, I see so many heads nodding, so I know many people that are here today are here because they've been through this in their own families, in their own houses. and. 30 to 60% of intimate partner violence perpetrators also abuse the children in the household. It breaks your heart. As much as you want to protect your baby, and we moms would do anything to protect our kids, sometimes you're in a situation where you can't. And it's so important to have resources like sister care where you can get out and you can take your children with you. And that is why the mayor has done the dunking booth in the city of Columbia. We've been doing toiletry drives for sister care so that when women decide to leave, they can take their babies with them and get them out of the bad situation. So sister care is so important here in the Midlands. It's a great resource. And let me invite Miss Leah with a last name that is hard to say. Say it, girl. Weisevik. Weisevik. <laughs> Miss Leah Weisevik, my friend from sister care. Okay, I have a three-year-old. I'm gonna use my mom voice. I'm sure y'all with kids remember the mom voice, right? Um, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm humbled and honored to be here with all of you today. Survivors of intimate partner violence, family members and friends who have lost loved ones to domestic homicide, dedicated community partners, passionate advocates, loyal supporters, and so many wonderful representatives from the City of Columbia. Thank you for having me. Again, my name is Leah Weisevek. I'm the Executive Director of Sister Care. Sister Care's mission is to reduce the occurrence and impact of domestic violence in the Midlands. We provide trauma-informed services, advocate for domestic violence survivors and their children, and we- say it's working again. Is it working? There we go. Goodness. Sister Care's mission is to reduce the occurrence and impact of domestic violence in the Midlands. We provide trauma-informed services, advocate for domestic violence survivors and their children, and promote prevention of domestic violence through community awareness and training. Sister Care offers a comprehensive range of services to include emergency shelter, a 24-7 crisis line, clinical counseling, housing programs, legal representation, rural advocacy, and teen outreach. 
In 2023, Sister Care's incredible team served over 4,000 survivors and their children. In addition, we provide crisis intervention and advocacy to over 2,000 crisis line callers, and we reach over 2,000 teens through our teen outreach program. I love our mission. I wake up every day believing in our mission, believing in survivors, believing that our community has the power to change this terrible narrative surrounding domestic violence, this nightmare that so many of us have experienced or witnessed. But Sister Care can't do it alone. The City of Columbia, lawmakers, healthcare providers, victim service agencies, law enforcement officers, none of us can do it alone. Domestic violence kills, it leaves bruises and scars on the inside and out, it leaves children feeling scared and helpless, it destroys families, and it leaves survivors traumatized and terrified, living life in fear. So we must work together to make real change. And I know we can do it. You wanna know how I know this? Last week, we got hit with a vicious storm. It was scary. The wind was howling, trees were crashing down, we lost power, and we're in complete darkness. When the sun rose, I ventured outside to take a better look at the huge oak tree that had fallen in my yard. I was shocked to see how many homes in my neighborhood had downed trees and other destruction resulting from the storm. What's next? I thought to myself. I peered around the corner and felt a smile spread across my face. A group of neighbors had already gathered. They had a plan. They would go door to door to ensure that their fellow neighbors were safe. They would hand out water, offer coolers to keep food safe, and lend a listening ear for those who were afraid and unsure of what was next. It only got better from there. The group grew and tasks were divided. While one group continued going door to door, another started sawing and removing limbs from fallen trees to help clear the roads. And another group put together boxes of snacks and drinks for the Dominion Energy workers who were already on site. Even our neighborhood Facebook group had individuals offering housing, gas, food, and more. No questions asked. Not one neighbor required proof that assistance was needed. Nor did they once doubt someone requesting assistance was being truthful. They didn't ask, why would you not have enough bottled water in your house knowing that a storm was coming? Or, Wow, all that damage you're talking about sounds a little far-fetched. Maybe you're exaggerating. These neighbors didn't say, hey, not my problem that Jennifer from down the street doesn't have enough supplies. Or, it's not my business if Bill needs help contacting his elderly mother to see if she's okay. Or, everyone knows that Stacy from across the street has a drinking problem. She was asking for that tree to crash into her roof if you want to know my opinion. These neighbors simply offered compassion and support. They offered help and resources and a friendly ear. As the day progressed, instead of feeling scared and defeated, people felt hopeful, supported, and empowered to move forward. It was inspiring to see a day that started out dark and scary end in goodwill and hope. But unfortunately, every day is a storm for domestic violence survivors and their children. Every day is filled with darkness and fear. Every day is a Helene, a Katrina, a Hugo. I believe that together we can stop these raging storms because as my neighbors showed us, we are better together than we are alone. Sister care advocates and clinicians are restoring the electricity by shining light on survivors with hope, healing, and services. Law enforcement is cutting down fallen trees and clearing the roads, creating a path of safety for survivors. Community partners are passing out water, providing needed support and compassion. The city of Columbia is using its strength and resources to remove the trees that have crashed through the roofs, showing survivors they are valued and heard. And each one of us here today can support survivors by shouting over the storm, 
and using our voices. Normalize conversations about domestic violence. Someone will hear you, and you may never know it. Talk about healthy relationships with your kids. You may prevent them from entering an abusive relationship and never know it. Use your voice and remind those you know and love that you are a safe and non-judgmental space. You may save someone's life and never know it. As we walk today, remember that storms have no power when we stand together and stand with survivors. Storms can't defeat us when we are facing the wind and rain together. Survivors, you are never alone. And now, it is a privilege and an honor to uh, introduce to you Eugenia. Eugenia is a strong and brave survivor of domestic violence who has utilized Sister Care services, and she's here today to share her powerful story. Everyone, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Eugenia as this year's Survivor Speaker. food can make something larger, more complex, and more violent, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in an opposite direction. And if you'll bear with me for a few minutes, I will take those words of E.F. Schumacher and I will show you how I moved myself into an opposite direction. Little did I know in May of 2003 that I would meet the man who would become my future date, future husband, father of my children, and eventual tormentor. Little did I know that behind the blue eyes and the flashy smile it was a person more dangerous than I could have ever imagined. Three years, two babies, and countless injuries and insults later, I found myself totally unrecognizable to the woman that I once was. Gone was my smile, replaced by a constant worried look. Gone were my teeth. The growing hole in my mouth was matched only by the hole that was growing in my soul. Gone was any self-esteem or self-worth, replaced by too many pounds of trying to control an uncontrollable situation. By 2010, my mind, my body, and my soul had had enough. And in October of that year, my relationship hit a fevered pitch at 6.30 that Sunday morning in front of my house, like any other house in a small town north of Dallas. And as I am in battle for a very fight for my life, I hear the sound of my four-year-old son screaming, please do not kill my mommy. Mm. See, my little boy, he didn't beg for his life. He begged for mine. And that is where I found my touch of genius and decided I had to move myself into an opposite direction. In the next three days were a flurry of activity, one safe house to another. I had no idea what I was running to, but I was all too familiar with the horror I was running from and run I did. Slowly but surely, we gained our courage and I ran east, far, and fast. And luckily, straight into the arms of Sister Care, where I got the services that I so desperately needed. Some people would say that is history, but I like to say that's my future. I am a proud survivor of domestic violence. And if there is one today who is within the sound of my voice, 
find your touch of genius, grab your courage, and move yourself into an opposite direction. Thank you for listening to me. God bless you. Thank you so much, Eugenia, for sharing your story. And we are all so proud of you. The mayor has a little gift for you. Y'all, I can, uh, hearing that story tears me out right now. Oh, um, you know, this is why we do it. This is why for 18 years the city of Columbia has had a domestic violence wall. That's why earlier we were talking about, talking about it more often, not just in October, but every day, knowing that resources are here. We got a solicitor who cares. We have a coroner who cares. I have my police chief here. You don't think that he's committed. He, he just got out of surgery. He's here. We created an office of violence prevention, not just because the, the topic at the time was gun violence, but the domestic violence was right there. Y'all, we are all part of a puzzle. And you know how a puzzle works, right? Each piece connects other pieces. And without that other piece, we can't. So I'm asking you today, as you leave here, figure out what piece you're going to be of that puzzle. How do we take those pieces and connect it so that we can stop this domestic violence? This affects our loved ones, our children. And we all know, folks, we've all had touches. And the story you just heard from Eugenia, how many times does that story have to be told? It shouldn't be. I want to thank you for taking the time to do that and share that story with us. I know that you're volunteering as well. Not only has she, she been through it, but now she's giving back. That's how we do it, folks. I also want to say a great thank you to Andrea for being here. And, you know, I didn't know her story. She didn't tell us. We just, fate happened that we, we ran into each other and said, let's, let's have you be here. I did not know that story. So please give it up for her being here, telling us, and being part of it. And with that, we have a small token oh, thank you. for you as well oh, so for taking nice. the time thank to you. be here with us I'll today. Give it to my assistant. <laughs> so when we leave here today and we take this walk, I hope everybody will take the opportunity nice to have a conversation with the person next to you to reach out. And if you know someone who's in a situation, let them know they're not alone, that we're here together. So let's go walk. Woo